Um, this question was asked by Christina. She says, my uncle and I combined money to put down on a house that I was to live in, and he would have the tax benefit here. Because my credit was bad, my name could only be on the title as a beneficiary. So the house is in the name of my uncle and as well as my mother. We verbally agreed that when I got my credit score up, I would pay him back and put the house into my name. My mother has assisted me in keeping the payments up. I'm assuming that these are the bond payments. We have all now agreed to sell the house and I have used my entire savings to get the house on the market. My mother and uncle have decided that they will only pay me for the materials I paid when I was remodeling the house. Is there anything I can do to receive a fair return on my investment? I put money down for the property and maintained it for many years. I was well paid for the remodel that, uh, that she was referring to earlier. Um, Bruno, can we provide Christina with some advice here? Right. So the simple, uh, I think the simple answer to this, or or rather, let's let's uh, paint the picture. So one of the concerns that I have with with something like this is, it happens quite often um, when it comes to affordability. A lot of people rely on partners, family members, friends, and that sort of thing. At that moment, when when they're doing this, they've got a good relationship. Everything's fine, and they go into this deal. Please buy on my behalf. Don't stress. Like in a couple of years, we'll deal with it. You know, there's a firm handshake, and you're done. And I suppose as lawyers, we deal with, let's say, the one out of 10 cases that go wrong. But for us, that's 100% of the time. Um, so our perspective is very skewed when it comes to things like this. And that's why we often keep emphasizing that it's so important to actually get uh, contracts in place in order to be able to govern this. If there's no contract in place, uh, now I can't recall from this question whether there was or wasn't. Uh, but if memory, uh, uh, Chris, do you mind just clarifying that? Was was anything uh, like drafted by the transferring attorneys? No, not that I know. No. No, not okay. uh, so, so if nothing's in place, what happens in our law is we have to look at the circumstances and the, and the facts of the matter so we can actually make a determination as to what the relationship could be. And this is when we look at the substance of the transaction, right? We try to figure out uh, what sort of agreement was in place if the parties can't agree to that. Now, my understanding from this specific instance is somebody else bought on their behalf, but now they're sitting as, as owners of the property and holding the title to this property. And so the presumption here is that they are owner. And if they're disputing that this, this viewer is owner, then there's very little we can do about that. For us, uh, prima facie, on the face of these documents, it, it shows that our, our, our viewer is not the owner of the property. And so now we need to look at this from a logical sense. So why would our client be contributing to a property if he's not owner of the property? Right. What um, you know, what what logic would there be for them to, for him, for example, to attend to bond payments? Is he living on the property? Could this be considered rental? Yes or no. If not, and bond payments are just being made, is he getting any benefit from the rental? So we need to look at all these facts because it, it, there needs to be a picture behind this because that's how we understand what the nature of it is. My understanding over here would probably be along the lines of if if the mother agrees with the viewer, you could probably make out a case that there was some, uh, some level of joint venture agreement here or collaboration agreement. And yes, one person held the property and they became owners of the property, but commercially speaking, what underlined, underlined that transaction was that each party would contribute something and would receive something in exchange. If those terms can actually be set out in a clear and logical way, um, and you know, there's support for something like this, you could probably go to court to actually enforce it. Um, worst case scenario, you might land up with you know, some sort of enrichment claim. 
Because if you've been paying these amounts and they weren't due by you, there's no contractual basis for you having paid these amounts and everyone's denying it and they want to completely benefit from the upside of this property, you could actually claim undue enrichment and collect everything back. So not just the renovations, everything that you paid. So that's worst case scenario, I feel. Get all your money back. Best case scenario, court believes that there was an underlying transaction that got you involved in the property transaction and that gave you some sort of upside. Um, and if your mom can support that, uh, you know, there's a good chance that you might be able to prove it. Ah, thanks, Bruno. Um, we will quickly then move along to the next question. And there are two questions that were asked here, and I believe there's some similarity between them. So I'm going to try as best as I can to marry them, but if not, I'm just going to ask them separately in their each individual scenarios. And that might provide benefit to some of our viewers as well, who may be going through something quite similar. Uh, Natalie asks, she says, my grandmother bought a house for her parents many years ago. After her parents passed on, her two siblings occupied the property and they too later passed away. She doesn't know much about the house documents, that's Natalie's grandmother, but she was later approached by her last remaining sibling to occupy the house. She paid my grand, Natalie says, 20,000 rand. A few months ago, my grand went to visit her sibling only to find the house empty and sold. My gran is now worried that the 20,000 rand she received from her sibling was to pay her off for the home. My grandmother is devastated as she ordinarily should be and would be. She wanted to have the house as a, a, a sort of halfway house for people who would come down, come over and, and lay down their heads when they were going through troubled times, but have it in the family. So she wants to know uh, where does she start to look for the documents and also what legal rights does her grand have? I'm going to quickly jump onto the second question, which is asked by Andy. Andy says, my partner bought a house a couple of years ago with his parents, both parents and girlfriend. This was done at the time to show affordability. He has been paying the bond rates and all other expenses on the house. No one else contributed anything to the home. He says a contract was drawn up between the parties with the property lawyers that also stipulated that each party should keep proof of their individual contributions. One of the part parties are now requesting that my partner pays them out as they want their share of the house. However, this person has not contributed a cent. What is the best way forward on this matter? Silna, I'm not sure if you want to tackle this. Yes, I'm happy to. Let's start, Shane. On the, on the first um, question with regards to the grandmother uh, buying the property, uh, well, having the property and then um, wanting it to, to be in the family so people can, can use it, it's, it's a very interesting question in the sense that as, as much as it's a very sad question because it seems like um, there was a lot of confusion in all of this. It's very strange for the simple reason that we can't transfer property in South Africa. You can't sell property without knowing about it. So what I mean is... If I give my gorgeous purple mouse to you, isn't it beautiful? Uh, so I give it to you and you are using it to sell it to somebody and you take the, oh, I don't know how much a mouse costs these days, but um, say somebody pays you 150 bucks, you take the 150 bucks, buy something pretty and the other person leaves with the mouse. I won't know about it. And when I say, Chris, don't you maybe want to give my mouse back? You're going to say, no, I don't know where it is. And you actually sold it and you used 150 bucks for, you know, some onica oil for your triceps. Um, <laughs> so I, I don't know um, if that makes any sense. Immovable property, however, we can't transfer without the owner's knowledge for the simple reason that the deeds office require the transfer documents to be signed by the owner of the property. So the thing that, that is um, very unfortunate, and, and maybe there's some value in um, posting uh, the recording we did or, or, or for the viewer to go back to our um, recording, uh, the conversation we had around transfer of property. How is property transferred in South Africa? 
um, to get an understanding of how complex this is, South Africa's um, a, a immovable property system or conveyancing system is one of the best in the world. And I'm not saying that because I am just, you know, yeah, yeah, yay, proudly South African. I'm also, but this is actually one of those things where we can be very proud of our immovable property system. Seriously, one of the best in the world because it is completely recorded and nobody can transfer property without that going through the registrar of deeds. And for us as attorneys um, who see conveyancing every single day, we know about the things that the deeds registrar would reject transfers on. Basically, the wind is not blowing in the right direction. The registrar of deeds isn't 100% comfortable that all the rates clearance, all the tax clearance, the consent from the, the owner, everything is done perfectly. The title deed is done perfectly. You will not get that property transferred. So I do hope that this is good news um, for the viewer that asked this question, because what typically happens is somebody will own the property, your grandmother, and then the sibling can pay the 20,000 rand with the intention to buy the property. But unless that property is transferred in the deeds office by the register of deeds, with the consent and signature of your grandmother, that property can't be transferred. So the good news is, I think it's super unlikely that that property doesn't belong to your grandmother anymore, especially if she is the original rightful holder of the title. So where I would start, and this full circle me back to the first question you asked me, is to do a deed search. And yes, you can, and no, Poppy does not limit you on that. If you contact basically any conveyance, uh, estate agent, almost anybody, or like I said, go on the TPN website, Lightstone, do a deed search on the property, and you will see the full history of who owned this property. And like we said in the, in the um, conversation about how property is transferred, remember your title deed never gets amended. It gets, they gets ad, you get add-ons. That was a difficult thing to come out of my mouth. You have add-ons to your title deed, but it never goes away and gets replaced. It stays the same thing. And you would be able to see who owned the property, how much it was sold for, when it was sold, and when it, the, the, the sale was registered. So you can see all that information. I would start there. If the property was, in fact, transferred to the sibling after the payment of 20,000 rand, and that wasn't your grandmother's um, intention, that would go back to Bruno's slightly earlier answer around what do we do if a property is then transferred incorrectly. If that was not the intention of the parties, that's a fraudulent transaction, and approaching a court would definitely um, leave you in a position where you can get... Um, successful uh, the, uh, 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 rescission of the sale and, and uh, the sale will be set aside and the transfer will be set aside and it will be transferred back to your grandmother. So I would start on the, um, on the, on the deed search. Um, to the second question, I got so carried away in my first one, I think, I, I hope Bruno sorry, remembers I, him. <laughs> um, can, I, can, I, can I read the second question again, just for ease of reference for our viewers? Oh, because that was, that was, yeah, so let, me, let me go for it. <laughs> uh, the question is uh, from Andy. My partner bought a house a couple of years ago ah. with his parents and girlfriend. This was done at the time to show affordability. He has been paying the bond, rates and all other expenses associated with the property. No one else has contributed anything to the house but uh, Andy's partner. A contract was drawn up between the four parties with the property lawyers. That also stipulates that each party should keep proof of their individual contributions. One of the parties are now requesting that my partner pays them out as they want their share of the house. However, this person has not contributed a cent. What is the best way forward on this matter? Ah, oh, okay. So I'll start, and Bruno, then I'm going to throw it to you. Um, so the thing about uh, buying property together is, unless you have a, a very clear agreement governing it, it's going to be a disaster. Now, the situation here is there was an agreement. I can't comment on the content of the agreement without seeing it. It does sound weird, 
um, that it would simply state you need to keep record of what you paid. And, and then what do we do with that? I do suspect that there will be proper clauses in that contract that deals with a situation like that, because this is shared ownership. And the, the contract governing this transaction will also have to be uh, registered so the parties, you can't co-own property just because, you know, once again, to my um, uh, mouse example, the three of us can buy a, a mouse together and not have a contract in that. You can't do the same um, and have it enforceable in immovable property. It has to be in writing has to be signed by all parties and has to be registered in the deeds office. So the contract doesn't have to be registered in the deeds office. But if four parties are the purchasers, that will be stipulated in the um, sale agreement. If there's an underlying contract to that, um, it doesn't have to form part of the um, sale agreement, but it would be um, very weird if there's a registration to four separate parties without that contract being um, captured um, as part of the as the offer to purchase. So my recommendation here would be to go back um, to the contract because we do have a ruling on law, the intrinsic evidence rule, which is if there is a written contract, you're not allowed to consider any evidence outside of the contract unless there is um, a, a claim for fraud or something like that, for instance, which doesn't sound um, to be the case in this particular matter. So I would start there um, and maybe take the contract and approach uh, 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 an attorney that's well versed in property law. Imagine you knew someone like that and, um, <laughs> and, and really get advice on the contract because this is more a contractual claim than a delictual claim. Um, uh, as far as I can see, I, uh, so it's going to go back to the to the word of the contract. Bruno, take take it from there, please. Sure. <laughs> um, yeah, so I absolutely agree with you. Um, this is very similar to the answer for for the previous question. Um, one does need to distinguish between uh, ownership and certain rights that can be acquired um, through some sort of partnership or joint venture and that sort of thing. Uh, so I suppose that's the difficulty where sometimes people get confused where they co-own properties or so it's so-called co-owned but especially when it comes to properties because of affordability what you typically find is people step in as directors of companies they sign sureties or they buy in their personal name but they've got some kind of agreement where everyone owns the property and again the problem with this is in our system this isn't actually ownership uh simply because the title deed dictates ownership. Um, so you would have, there would, the exceptions to this would be, for example, if there's trust with beneficiaries and those beneficiaries benefit from it, uh, people holding instructions to act on somebody else's behalf. But these are um, often governed in our law, you know, through curatorships or whatever the case is. So it's just clear cut. I'm owner of the property. The property is in my name. I accept that I'm owner of the property. So to take it one step further, again, we look at any underlying transaction. So I can be owner of the property. I can approach Solna and Chris and go, listen, you know, let's benefit from this together. I'll retain ownership. So as part of my contribution, contribution, I'm going to give this JV uh, the use of the property. Silna's going to use her contacts to try and get the property tenanted or airbnb uh, You know, Chris is the muscle, so he's going to make sure that, you know, nothing goes wrong in those properties um, when, when his triceps are all good and, and not <laughs> stiff anymore. Um, so we can do that. And Solna will have a claim against me. Uh, Chris would have a claim against me for whatever benefits are ostensibly due to them in terms of this JV agreement. So it's a different way of looking at it where we don't confuse the term ownership and we start looking at what sort of benefits a person can derive from a property. Because remember, these benefits even go so far as subletting. Um, it's, at the end of the day, the, the, the tenant is not an owner of the property, but if he's got the right to sublet, you're going to be ambushed. <laughs> Isn't he cute? I was worried. <laughs> um, if the tenant has the right to sublet, the tenant actually has a right 
to utilize the property to the exclusion of the owner during that period of time. So once, a, once we understand that distinction, it's, it's, uh, it's, we're better able to define what governs the relationship. Now, if this contract was drafted, I can only imagine if drafted by an attorney that this would be some kind of joint venture agreement or some kind of option to purchase at a later stage or some kind of loan agreement with a repayment term, whatever it is, that contract is going to be key to all of this. And all the information we have, regretfully, is that is is what's been said but that's not enough to know what the true relationship behind this is so first put a call check the joint uh, check this agreement if this agreement provides for parties to make contributions right one assumes that there's some kind of schedule of contributions that are going to be made because I'm guessing there's some kind of obligation for it. And if there's an obligation and the person doesn't perform, they're actually in breach of this contract. So uh, there, there can be some kind of recourse. So it shouldn't be as easy as I want to exit, pay me out, because the contract should probably provide to say, listen, you'll only benefit if you perform. If you don't perform, then you can't expect to benefit. That would be a contract that I would expect to find in a deal like this. But the contract needs to speak to us. Otherwise, there's no way of us knowing. Uh, you know, another alternative is to claim all the contributions the person should have paid uh, before they allowed to exit or claim any benefit. We've got no idea. So I think that's that's kind of key to all of this. Um, and then, yeah, approach an attorney that can interpret this contract and and take some action. No, thanks, Bruno. Thanks a lot. I've got a, I've got a last question here, and this question is actually asked by. Uh, be fine young gentleman named Christopher Abrams. Christopher wants to know, he says, he's got a home and the home is registered. Uh, the deed is it's registered with the deeds office, but he also owns a cat and he wants to find out, is the house actually his by virtue of it being registered at the deeds office or is it, does it belong to the cat? So now, I think you should answer this one. Chris, my question is, have you ever owned a cat? <laughs> No. <laughs> okay, so, so that's why know. you that's why you asked the question. I am the proud owner of three cats. You've just met whiskey. Um, and the truth about a cat is you will never own a cat. But a cat owns you, your house, <laughs> your car, your children, basically everything. That's the thing about a cat. So the truth about property ownership is when there's a cat involved, everything <laughs> belongs to the cat. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for clearing that up. And, <laughs> and on that note, uh, we've had a fabulous session. I really do think we did. Um, I want to thank our viewers for joining us. And I also want to thank you for asking your questions because without you, we wouldn't be having these uh, webinars. So thank you. And I, and I implore you to continue posting your questions and posing them to us. Uh, and I'm looking forward to seeing you all next week, Wednesday at six o'clock. Uh, as always, thank you, Solna. Thank you, Bruno. Sure. And from us at the Property Law Alliance, we wish you a productive week. Cheers, stay safe and goodbye.